No, on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it they made confession and worshipped the Lord their God. On the stairs of the Levites stood Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Buni, Sherebiah, Bani, and Chenani. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabneah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pathahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Good morning, church. Let's pray before we begin. Dearly Father, I pray, Lord, as we get into Nehemiah 9.10, that we would reflect uh, on your word, not as just history, but a time where we can reflect on your goodness and your nature so that we may glorify you with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If we haven't met yet, my name is Don, and I'm wondering how you react when things go wrong. It's not a light question, is it? Recently, for me personally, things went south. I broke my car mirror, grazed it on the side, and I cracked my phone case and screen. And to top it all off, when I received my mail, I realized I made a mistake. I ordered the wrong camera lens for my camera. Pray for me. Have you had a downhill week recently? Or to ask another question, how do you respond when you realize you've made a mistake? Do you try to push it aside? Or when guilt arises, do you try to distract yourself with busyness? Or like me, are you tempted to blame others? In a culture that tells us that taking responsibility for sin is shameful, Nehemiah 9.10 tells us to reflect on God's goodness and to confess sin well so that we may commit our lives more to God. I encourage you to open your Bibles to Nehemiah 9.10. Because I want to pay attention to three areas that our passage has for us today. Number one, we're going to look at how God's goodness calls us to reflection. Two, that it calls us to confess and to celebrate in devotion. And finally, it calls us to commit our entire lives to God. Before we look at our first observation, we need some context. Last week, if you were here in the evening services or look online, you will remember that Pastor Matt reflected with us in looking at Ezra preaching his heart out and the Levites leading a great Bible reading party. You see, the Levites continue to read the word. 
And God uses them to ignite reflection and confession and worship. So let's start with our first point. Reflecting on a loving God. Here in chapter 9, we see the Israelites gathered in humble fasting. Here, verse 1. On the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. The Levites continued to teach the word, guiding them in reflection and confession. Look at verses 3 and 5. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for a quarter of the day. And for another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped the Lord, their God. Then the Levite said, stand up and bless the Lord, your God, from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. So how do they reflect on God's goodness? Verses 6 to 31 Tell us that the Levites guide the people into reflecting on God's good, kind nature throughout all Israelite history up until that point in six major parts. First, God is seen as the recognized creator. You see that in verse 6. The maker of promises to Abraham in verses 7 to 8. Merciful. Saving acts in verses 9 to 11. And from verses 21, 12 to 31, we see God as provider in the desert, protector in the promised land, and a royal patient father, even in light of Israelite disobedience. So thousands of years later, What does this say about our Lord? Why does reflection on God's goodness matter? Well, because no matter how things go wrong in our lives and in the world, we need to remember through our weeks that God is even good in our sin and in our broken world. More than that, Now that Jesus has come, he continues to be good to his people and church, us. Is that something that you've reflected on this week? Just think for a moment. Does that impact your life, thinking about how good God is? This hit me recently. Last week, I met a young woman from one of the churches that I used to attend. She has multiple health conditions. One so severe that if she gets hyper-stressed or commits to a full-term pregnancy, there's a strong chance that she could die. It's gone. That's the end of her life. You might be thinking, Don, how is that God's goodness displayed? Well, when I met her again, she just looked me right in the eyes and said, Don, I might die. I might die real young. But I'm going to be with Jesus. And that's all that matters. I needed a reminder that God's goodness is complete in Jesus. Goodness that is greater than any pain, suffering, or illness but real hope now and into eternity. See, a week later, reflecting on this chat, this goodness of God helped shake the gloom out of my broken car mirror. If you don't know the greatest goodness found in God, Reflect on Jesus' life in a gospel like Luke. You see, Jesus wasn't only sinless. 
He was the full expression of God's goodness in human flesh. Can I encourage you to reflect on his life, to confess and turn from your sin? Because Jesus, as he says in Luke 23, 43, he offers us by faith indestructible hope, eternal paradise, escape from wrath. In light of this reflection in Nehemiah 9, how else does it impact our lives? How have you woken up recently? How have you felt waking up? I mean, other than the cold mornings this month, have you got out of bed or got through to the end of your day with a deep sense of worry, frustration, or maybe even hopelessness? I find these are the times that I preach my testimony to my soul. How I came to faith or what God has been doing in my life in the past years or decades. You see, I find reflecting on God's goodness so uplifting. It can take me out of the gloom and the intensity of life situations. Because God is so good, I know that he's going to show me more of his goodness as I pursue a more holy life in Christ. And secondly, just look at our society. It doesn't take long to realize that our Australian culture doesn't reflect on the goodness of God. Have you seen the last census results of 2021? From 2016, there's been a decline of Australians identifying as Christians from 52% to 44% in a matter of five years. Our nation needs to know God and the goodness that is in Jesus, that he created the world, sent his son to die for us, to live and die for us, and he has a plan for this world. Pray for God's goodness to be known. Whether that's through evangelism, the work of God's spirit, or the active faith of Christians. I mean, isn't it a reminder how much we and our nation need Jesus? As verse 33 says, many of us could say this of our lives when we sin. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us. For you have dealt faithfully and we've acted wickedly. As we've seen, reflection individually and communally is healthy. Reminding us of God's holy commitment to drawing people out of sin. So we've looked at the goodness of God and his call on reflection on him. Let's look at the way that he encourages us to confess and celebrate new devotion to him. Number two, helping us to confess our sin and celebrate renewed devotion. As we continue in the passage, we see that God's goodness not only impacts our reflection, it changes the way that we bring our brokenness and sin to him and celebrate God's love in our lives. Follow with me in verse 32. Now therefore, our God, the awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardships seem little to you as has come upon us until this day. Do you hear what the Levites are saying? They're confessing to our awesome God that they are in the wrong and they know why they're in a difficult situation under the Persian kings. Verse 36 clarifies the damage of their sin. 
Verse 36, Behold, we are slaves this day in a land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruits and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves. And people know why they're in slavery. Before a faithful, righteous, caring God, they were unfaithful. But the Levites and the people don't remain in that somber sadness. They celebrate. In fact, in the most joyful response possible, they recommit to the covenant. Verse 38, because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. They confess and devote themselves to God's goodness. As we continue in Nehemiah 10, verse 1 to 27, we can see the names of the leaders written down. They realize that there's no other way to live. They know what's at stake. They devote their lives to God, all of his word even asking for God to punish them if they fall into disobedience. Verses 28 to 29 say this. The rest of the people, all who have knowledge and understanding, enter into a curse, an oath, to walk in God's law, to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord. So as Christians, this Passage makes us think, doesn't it? What does confession look like in your life in these past few weeks? Has it moved you into deeper repentance and celebration of God? I know for myself, even recently, I've mistaken confession for feeling sorry for myself. To, put, to the point that I don't feel like I've really offended God with my sin. And I'll be honest, I've seen my self-pity being challenged by God recently. This week, I heard the testimonies of two people in the midst of homelessness, and they professed with sheer confidence that they know the greatest treasure of all, faith in Jesus. I had to walk away and just confess to God, like, (laughs) it's such a precious profession to hear, isn't it? I had to confess because I realized I was still just so self-absorbed over my wrong camera purchase. It was actually refreshing to confess to Christ and remember what is truly precious. I don't know about you, but I'm not well off. But I wonder if you're like me and you find yourself getting caught up in material goods, materialism. Confession points us to God's kingdom and renews our sight for what Christ loves. But what does it mean for you? What have you been wrestling with? Is tiredness or stress pressuring relationships? Has work impacted the way that you care and love your children? Or maybe in the way that you discipline them? Or do you find yourself slowly drifting away from people? Do you need to re-engage in encouraging others and confessing with other Christians, praying over work, parenting, ups and downs, singleness, family matters? Or maybe there are private struggles I want to be gentle on this. Maybe there are struggles that are getting the better of you. Is it time to confess sexual sin once more 
because it's arisen. It's a helpful reminder that here in this church, we have a valiant man group that meets every month to walk with men in this area of sexual discipleship. But I'm also praying for our women in the church to also form a regular group, a regular ministry that also meets in this area too. It's not just a guy problem. But whether it's confessing battles at work, opening up about trauma or private matters, I've been there. And confession has always been worth it. That's why I'm not here to judge or offer an oversimplified solution. But if it's personal, can I encourage you? It might be time to get alongside Christians regularly. Even get in professional, clinical professionals involved. Not just working through strategies, but finding a community that prays and lives off the word as they journey with you. No matter where you're at, I pray that your experience of confession has been sweet and filled with peace. Peace that comes from confessing and celebrating God's goodness. So what else does that look like for us as Christians? There are two aspects of confession that may help us in our faith. The first is simple, but actually easy to forget. It's important for us to confess in community. As the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer points to, he points to James 5.13. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. But he also adds on a strong truth to that. He says, he who is alone with his sin is utterly alone. And this is more than just being between two other people. But it's in community. Did you see the list in chapter 10, 1 to 27, it wasn't just a couple of people committing to the covenant. It was all the leaders representing the people, putting their names down, acknowledging their sin, and committing to a God-fearing life in community. But what does that look like on a ground level? One way is through our gospel weekly communities. But it's important to ask a further question. What kind of gospel communities are we cultivating? Are they safe places for confession and celebration? To become more Christ-like and devoted to him? No GC is perfect. But from the stories that I hear week after week, more so, yes. But I'd love to see more GCs started in this church community so that there are more groups fellowshipping over the word, confessing and celebrating. Because out of the 400 here in this church, possibly 500 that are regular to semi-regular, not much over 200 people are connected in regular gospel communities. This is why I want to raise the need that our church needs more GCs. But to get them started, we need leaders and servants to support them. People like the list of Nehemiah 10, who have their hearts set on guiding and caring for God's people in community. If that's on your heart to create or support a new gospel community, can I ask you to pray 
on it. And maybe in a week or so, actually talk to a GC leader on what that might look like. After all, GCs take prayer and time to form. It's encouraging to know that some, many even, start so small, some as little as four, getting together at church or at home. But whether you're supporting or leading or starting a GC, can you lift them up in prayer? It really matters. So we've covered a call to reflection, confessing and celebrating in devotion. Let's look at our final section, the goodness of God, committing our entire lives. As we move forward into chapter 10, we see God's people are committing their entire lives to God. How do we see their commitment? It might surprise you. They're they're committed by observing the Sabbath. Here, verse 31. And if the peoples of the land bring goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy it from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. The Sabbath is more than just physical rest. It was a way to keep God's people spiritually pure. It guarded them from pagan religions, the nations around them, and their pagan practices. And as you'll see, the Sabbath is connected to offerings and pure worship. Listen to verses 35 and 37. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. Also to bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle as it is written in the law. Further on in 37, and to bring to the Levites the tithes who collect the tithes in all the towns where we labor. In Old Testament times, financial and material offering not only expressed devotion, it also kept the temple running, pure and in right order. This was a major part of God's people maintaining a healthy relationship with him. This is important to touch on. If the temple was well-maintained, It usually meant the spiritual health of the community was kept as a priority. This is why the Levites are committed to the temple's health. Look at verse 39 of chapter 10. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of the grain, wine and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are. We will not neglect the house of our God. The community of God's people are all in to the deepest part of their lives, right to their pockets and their hearts. That's how they resist the pagan gods and the love of financial gain and security. Does that bring up any thoughts of our Christian lives? Offering was a command in Nehemiah's day. And for us as Christians, it has great relevance for us today. We are not in the Old Testament times with the temple. Thank goodness, blood sacrifices would have been messy. But a physical place such as church is a critical community to support financially. Recently, God has challenged me personally in this area. I haven't been on church staff for long, but it's astounded me on how much offering and financial giving impacts the life of the church. 
Reflect with me on this one. I'm sure many of us can recall a multitude of encouraging and gospel-filled conversations at church. Chats and church services that have moved us into deeper worship of God. But financial giving doesn't more than provide a place for gospel chats and relationships. It contributes to the function of this church community. From the water, the electricity bills, to having kitchens and serving with people with rooms throughout the week, to having staff workers care for your children and the young people and those afflicted in our community. If you call this church your home and haven't committed to regular giving, can I encourage you? Giving impacts the ministry of the gospel that is expressed through this church. It's the reason why we have these ministries such as youth and city kids and missions and gospel communities to meet. Ultimately, you're supporting and giving access for people to start and build their relationship with Jesus. And lastly, Nehemiah 10 shows us that God's community are committed to the Sabbath as an expression of actually resting in God. As Christians, how are you resting in God? Are you protecting your time of physical rest, your time of worship and prayer? Personally, I'm thankful for family and friends that tell me to say no. It's strange for me. I don't like saying no or asking me questions and how I'm sleeping. How is my time with the Lord? Is that protected, those times delighting in God's word, trusting in him? when finances are tough, when family situations are going through hard times? Are you teaching your children how to Sabbath rest? It's not just for parents that need to commit to Sabbath rest. But whether you're single, married, young or old, We need to take care of these bodies. After all, it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's given these hearts and minds to glorify Him, and He wants us to be in true restfulness. As the music team come up, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for Nehemiah 9.10. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to reflect on your goodness and encourage us into lives filled with confession, full of celebration, so that we may grow in deeper devotion to you restful, life-filled devotion to you. In Jesus' name, amen.